welcome to the chapter on the arm assembly language uh, arm assembly languages are some of the most popular and most exciting assembly languages to learn so in this chapter we'll have a lot of fun so this chapter is a part of the book computer organization and architecture published by myself uh, dr smriti sarangi uh, it was published by mcgrawhill in the year 2015 and should be available in almost all bookstores and online uh, you know both normal bookstores and online bookstores so uh, why study the arm instruction set and uh, so so let's first look at why study and then what's the background required so arm is a very very popular instruction set so almost all the phones today as of 2016 uh tablets and all kinds of small computing devices uh, which are not desktops or laptops run on arm processors so they use the arm instruction set so arm is a company located in uh, cambridge uk so they actually license their designs and then the designs are used by other manufacturers uh, to you know incorporate them in silicon chips so uh, before actually we start this chapter i would like to make a point that uh, readers should already have a good understanding of assembly language in the sense that they should have read the previous chapter which is chapter 3 and understood a lot of things about how assembly programs are written how the instructions how assembly instructions work uh, the notion of functions the, no the notion of the stack the notion of encoding so all of this needs to be there and the reason that the book has been designed in such a way is basically that if you, you know it is not possible at least in my view to give an introduction to assembly language and teach an advanced assembly language at the same time it is better to separate the concerns so it is better to first teach what an assembly language is like a very simple one and then move to uh teaching an advanced assembly language which is used in commercial processors uh because then a student would have the right amount of understanding to actually uh, understand what a state of the art uh, assembly instruction set looks like so uh keeping this in mind i will actually start this chapter at a slightly higher level because my assumption is that readers are already uh coming uh, after read chapter 3 so they understand the basics of assembly languages and they also understand how to write simple programs with assembly languages and have a basic understanding of uh, how to implement uh, uh, if statements loops uh, functions using stacks using assembly language so so these are some of the concepts we'll take for given in this particular chapter so coming back to arm so arm has a lot of licenses all over the world so what arm produces is uh, they uh, pr uh, they create the design of a processor and then they sell the design the design can be incorporated by a third party with other components so for example if arm sells a processor to a phone company then they can incorporate the arm processor and also have other uh, smaller circuits around it for uh, for example a circuit to process inputs from the camera or a circuit uh, to interface with the accelerometer in the phone so all of these additional circuits can be added so the arm instruction set as such is very very versatile uh, so along with a lot of integer instructions it supports floating point instructions and it has uh, what are called vector extensions so we'll discuss more about vector instructions in chapter 11 uh, but vector uh, instructions allow us to do multiple additions uh, at the same time in the same cycle so we'll not be discussing these extensions also arm has a very popular uh, i would say an assembly sub language or an extension it's called the thumb instruction set and a lot of arm programs actually use the thumb instruction set which is a slightly simpler set of instructions than what we present here in uh, you know in this chapter so i can refer to it as the thumb isa or the thumb assembly languages uh so so basically the thumb instruction set 
uh, is similar to this it's slightly simpler we'll not discuss this uh, in this chapter uh, we'll discuss the generic arm instruction set for, for integers only in this chapter so we'll have five separate uh, sections here we'll first start with basic instructions move to advanced instructions then look at branch instructions memory instructions load store kind of instructions and finally consider instruction encoding so similar to simple risk arm has 16 registers they are numbered from r0 to r15 and unlike simple risk and many many other assembly languages the program counter is explicitly visible and the program counter can be used to affect branches and so on so so this is exposed to software is exposed to the assembly language the memory is standard von neumann architecture what this means is that the instruction memory and the data memory is fused to one uh, so this is uh, you know a typical facet of the von neumann architecture that there is one view of memory it's not separate so out of the 16 registers that arm has uh, some of them are reserved for special purposes so let's take a look at them so r15 is the program counter so i'm starting uh, you know backwards uh, arm r15 is the program counter so it's referred to as either r15 or the pc r14 is the link register uh, it's you can also think of it as the return address register r13 is uh, reserved for keeping the stack pointer or SP uh, R11 and R12 uh, have well R11 and R12 can be assigned a special connotation sometimes uh, so R12 is an intra procedure called scratch register which basically means uh, it can explicitly be used to uh, save temporary values inside a function call but other registers can be used as well and R11 is called a frame pointer so we'll discuss what is a frame pointer uh, actually towards the end of this chapter and but we'll discuss more about a frame pointer in the next chapter uh, on x86 assembly so we will be using a slightly different kind of semantics in this chapter so we'll uh, every single instruction will be explained with the help of a table so in the table the first column will look at the semantics which is something that we introduced <coughs> towards the end of the last chapter so it will basically show uh, what are the different modes of the instruction then we'll give an example and then we'll talk about the explanation in the register transfer notation that we have introduced so the simplest of simple instructions in the arm isa is the move instruction so what does the move instruction do the move instruction transfers a value into a register so let's say maybe move r1 r2 so it essentially transfers the value of r2 to r1 alternatively the move instruction can transfer the value of an immediate into a register so the first operand is always a register the second operand can either be a register or an immediate so let's consider the second example move r1 so so here is a you know idiosyncrasy of the arm isa that all immediates are preceded with a hash so the moment we add this hash character over here so you can see the hash character will be above 3 on your keyboard so all immediates in arm need to be preceded or prefixed with a hash so when we say move r1 hash 3 what this essentially moves is that I take register R1 and I move 3 to it. So, so this is the simplest uh, instruction in the ARM ISA. So move has a variant, it's called MVN. MVN is move not. So this is similar to the not instruction in simple risk so what we do is that uh, the uh, when we do mvn r1 comma r2 essentially the once complement or every single bit flipped 
uh, is transferred from R2 to R1. So this tilde sign is the ones complement. So just to re uh, recapitulate, the ones complement of 1, 0, 0, 0 in Boolean is 0, 1, 1, 1. So every single bit is replaced with its complement. 1 is replaced with 0 and 0 is replaced with 1. So the MVN instruction is essentially the same as a move instruction, but instead of moving uh, the register or the immediate, it moves in the complement of the register or immediate. So now let's take a look at arithmetic instructions. The arithmetic instructions are almost, you know, the add and sub are exactly the same as simple risk. Uh, so in this case, the add and sub instructions, similar to simple risk, the first operand is the destination. The second operand uh, is the first re registered source, which is RS1, uh, recall chapter 3. And the second operand can either be a register or an immediate. So uh, an example would be add R1, R2, R3. So in this case, we add R2 plus R3 and save the result in R1. So uh, again, you know, I would like to mention that I'm deliberately going slightly fast. Because my assumption is that students have already picked up a certain amount of background in the previous chapter. So they will find covering this chapter slightly easier, right? Uh, but if you, let's say, take a look at this chapter from scratch, you will find it slightly difficult. So I would then ask you to look at the lectures or read the book for the previous chapter, which is chapter three. So. Uh, Coming back to the add instruction, I can alternatively write add R1, R2, and hash 3. So what this would do is that in R1, it would save R2 plus 3. Uh, similarly, we have the subtract instruction, which is exactly the same as it was in the simple risk instruction set. So we have the register destination first. So the first operand over here is the register destination. Then uh, we have two source operands. One of them is a registered source and the other is a source slash uh, immediate, source or an immediate. So when I write sub R1, R2, R3, Essentially, inside R1, we are having uh, placing R2 minus R3. So similar to subtract, there is another instruction. It's called RSB or reverse subtract. So in reverse subtract, instead of subtracting R2 and R3, uh, instead of doing R2 minus R3, we actually do R3 minus R2. So uh, here a reader can ask, you know, if you have the sub instruction, why you need a reverse subtract instruction, right? Well, the answer is simple in the sense, let's say that you want to compute 3 minus R1, not R1 minus 3, 3 minus R1. We cannot write an instruction of the form. So let's say you want to set this to R2. We cannot write an instruction of the form R2 Right, so this is not allowed because the second operand has to be a register. So this is not allowed. But what we can write is RSP or reverse subtract. Uh, oops, sorry, there shouldn't be a comma here. R2, R1, and 3. So what this would do is this would set R2 to 3 minus R1, which is exactly what we needed. So in simple risk, this, doing this would actually require two instructions because we would first subtract our, uh, we would first subtract three from R1, so compute R1 minus three and then multiply it with minus one. So the designers in ARM are very smart. Instead of uh, you know having this two instruction solution, they created a new instruction called RSP reverse subtract, which allows us to compute three minus R1 in a single instruction. All right, so now let's take a look at some examples. 
So the first example is write an ARM assembly program to compute 4 plus 5 minus 19 and save the result in R1. So here is a simple solution which is simple but it's not optimal but nevertheless let's, look at, let's take a look at it. So we first save 4 in R1, we save 5 in R2 using the move instruction. Then we add R1 plus R2, save it in R3. We move 19 to R4. Then we subtract 19 from R3, which is R1 plus R2, and save the result in R1. A slightly more sol uh, better solution, which is optimal, we put 4 in R1. Then we do R1 equals R1 plus 5. In the sense, R1 will become 9. Then we do R1, we set R1 to R1 minus 19. And the previous value of R1 is 4 plus 5, 9. So we compute 9 minus 19 as minus 10, which is the final answer. So this was a slower solution, easy to understand. This is slightly difficult to understand, but not very difficult because in the first line, we set R1 to 4. In the second line, we do R1 is R1 plus 5, which uh, all of you can verify is what is exactly uh, you know, mentioned in the statement of the problem. Then we subtract uh, 19 from the sum and we get the right answer. Now let's take a look at logical instructions. So logical instructions are also very similar to the arithmetic instructions. So the first three instructions are somewhat easy. The fourth instruction is slightly difficult. So the first instruction is the AND instruction, which is very similar to what we had uh, with simple risk. Uh, so uh, in the AND instruction is the same idea that the first, so in all of these instructions, the first operand is the destination. Then we have the first source and the second source. The second source operand can either be a, uh, can either be a register or an immediate. So one example would be AND R1, R2, R3, where we set R1 as R2 and R3. So EOR is actually exclusive OR, XOR or ZOR as we call it. So in EOR, R1, R2, R3, we have R1, which is being set to R2, XOR, R3. ORR is logical OR. So in a logical OR, what we do is that uh, this is similar to the OR instruction in simple risk. So we just compute a logical OR of R2 and R3. So the important point to note is that in all of these instructions, the instruction per se is only three letters. So in simple risk, we had some two letter instructions like OR and so on. So that's not the case in LD and ST. So that is not the case in ARM. So in ARM, uh, they have tried to uh, maintain the length of the instruction the same. So that's the reason or they have replaced with ORR. So the BIC, the bit clear instruction is uh, slightly unclear at the moment. So what this is, this is basically R1 is R2 and not of R3. So let's maybe consider a simple example and see uh, what is this. So, so, so let's consider R2 being, uh, let's maybe just consider four bits to make our life easy and the rest of the bits are all zero. And similarly, let R3 be so not of this quantity would be 1101. One, one. Now this number and this number is equal to 1 and 0 is 0, 1 and 1 is 1, 1 and 0 is 0, 1 and 1 is 1. See, if you see what is happening over here is that all the bits that are set in R3, uh, so all the bits that are 1 in R3, in not of R3, those bits become 0. And when that is ended with some other quantity, all the bits at those bit positions become zero. So this, that's where the name bit clear comes from. So, or alternatively, if I want to explain, if this is, let's say the first operand, uh, which in this example is R2, 
and this is the second operand which is R3 all the bits that are set at different points at similar bit positions in the final result we have zeros so it's like those bits at th those bit positions are getting cleared so this is called a bit clear instruction or a BIC instruction so let's again consider an example this time with boolean variables so write an arm assembly program to compute a not b uh, sorry a or b uh, the entire thing not uh, where a and b are one bit boolean values assume that a is 0 and b is 1 save the result in r0 so to compute the not of a or b what we do is that uh, so basically arm uh, accepts hexadecimal numbers as well so the format is the same first have a hash to signify an immediate and then you write 0x to signify that it's in hex so what we do is that we load the value of 0 into r0 and we load so I'm sorry we or this with 1 so the value of a or b at the moment is saved in r0 Subsequently, what we do is we compute the not of R0 using the MVN instruction. So we set R0 as the not of R0. So uh, in this case, uh, what we are doing uh, is that uh, we are loading two Boolean variables uh, with constants. We are computing their OR and then finally taking their logical complement. Let us now look at the multiplication instructions that are there in the ARM ISA. So the simplest variant of the multiplication instruction that we have in ARM is uh, MUL, M-U-L. Uh, so the MUL instruction is very similar to the add and subtract instructions. For the first operand is a destination register henceforth we have two operands the first source operand is always a register and the second one can be in register or immediate so this is straightforward r1 is r2 times r3 so even the arm is a risk instruction set it has some slightly complicated instructions and so you know there is a tr basic trade-off the trade-off is do we always prefer simplicity or occasionally can we make our instruction set slightly complicated such that you know some commonly executing patterns in programs can be accommodated so one such commonly executing pattern which is there in a lot of programs you know particularly codes that use linear algebra and matrix operations is the MLA operation the mat uh, multiply and accumulate so this actually takes four registers as operands uh, the first register is the destination. So in this example, R1 is the, is the destination. Uh, so out of the three source operands that we have, what we compute is R2 times R3 plus R4. So we have a multiplication operation where the first and second source operands are being multiplied and we are adding this, this with R4. So this is uh, typically required in a lot of linear algebra kind of computations. That's the reason this instruction is supported. The other interesting aspect of multiplying two numbers is like this. So consider a 32-bit instruction set. So the range of the number system is pretty much between minus 2 to the power 31 to 2 raised to the power 31 minus 1. So let's say we multiply minus 2 to the power 31 with minus 2 to the power 31. The answer will be 2 to the power 62, which is well outside the range of a 32-bit number system. And so as a result, we'll have an overflow. But let's say we don't want to have an overflow and we want to have some mechanism by which we can store, uh, <coughs> the, uh, so store the product without an overflow. So for this, let's do a little bit of math here. So as you see, the largest number that we can get by multiplying two sign numbers, uh, two 32-bit sign numbers is two, to, 2 raised to the power 62. If I consider two unsigned numbers, 
So basically, the largest number uh, that I can get. Uh, so so in, a, in an unsigned number system with 32 bits, uh, the largest number is 2 raised to the power 32 minus 1. So if I sort of square this, then <coughs> this will be 2 to the power 64 minus 2 times. plus 1. So we shall see that in both these cases, so this is signed, this is signed multiplication where we consider them to be signed numbers, this is unsigned. So in any case, we be it either signed or unsigned, 64 bits are sufficient to keep the product. Sixty-four bits in this sense are sufficient. So for this purpose, ARM has two instructions, SMUL and UMUL. So SMUL is a sign multiplication, where we actually multiply uh, the third and fourth operands. We multiply R2 times R3. We do a sign multiplication. So we assume that R2 and R3 are signed, and the final result is signed. So the sixty-four bit product is actually, it can't be saved in one register because it's a 32-bit register, but it can be saved in two registers. So the lower 32 bits can be saved in R0, and the more significant 32 bits can be saved in R1. So together we'll have a 64-bit quantity. So this is uh, the SMUL instruction. Uh, does this with four operands, where we multiply the third and fourth operand, and the first and second operands together store one number, where uh, R0 stores the lower 32 bits and R1 stores the upper 32 bits. So we have a similar instruction called UMUL, which is an unsigned multiplication. So this is, so if uh, you would see this instruction and uh, the uh, upper instruction and lower instruction are exactly the same. The only difference is instead of a signed multiplication, it's an unsigned multiplication. So we treat R2 and R3 also as unsigned quantities and we perform an unsigned multiplication. So the final result will fit within 64 bits. The lower 32 bits can be saved in R0 and the upper 32 bits can be saved in R1. So the only difference between SMUL and UMUL is SMUL does a signed multiplication and UMUL does an unsigned multiplication. Now let us consider an example. So let us compute 12 cube plus 1 and save the result in R3. So let's do one thing. Let's load the values. So load the values basically means transfer the values. Uh, so let's transfer 12 to R0 and let's transfer 1 to R1. So now let's perform the logical computation. So in the ARM ISA, uh, the at symbol uh, is used to specify that what lies after it is a comment. So let's first multiply R0 with R0, which is, let's compute 12 square and save it in R4. So R4 will contain 12 square. Now here is the greatness of the MLA instruction, multiply and accumulate. So here we compute R3 is R4 times R0. plus R1. R4 is already 12 square and R0 is 12. So this is 12 cube plus the value in R1 is 1. So we get 12 cube plus 1. So what we can see is that using the MLA instruction, uh, computing 12 cube plus 1 actually became very simple and we could actually do it in two assembly instructions after we had the values in the in the registers loaded. So this is actually you know very cheap and very fast. So the user should keep this in mind that occasionally uh, you should take a look at some of the advanced instructions that ARM provides such as MLA, SMUL and UMUL to make the computation easier and also reduce the lines of code because in assembly language lower is the lines of code more efficient is the program.
Now let's take a look at some of ARM's advanced instructions. So ARM has a notation of a shifter operand. So uh, let's see what it is. So consider uh, a register. So we can optionally specify after a register ID a shift amount. So there are four ways that we can actually shift a register in ARM. So it's a uh, so LSL. So let me first explain what is there in this table. So LSL means logical shift left. So let me just write, uh, or maybe I can write here LSL. Oops, sorry, LSL is shift left. LSR is logical shift right. So this is similar to simple risk. ASR is arithmetic shift right. So there is no arithmetic shift left, so that's the reason we have not defined it. So LSL is the same as the LSL in simple risk, a logical shift left. And uh, so then there are two kinds of right shifts. In a logical shift right, we add zeros to the MSP. And in arithmetic shift right, we replicate the sign bit. So given a register, uh, we can uh, add these three kinds of shifts to it. and uh, also, we have this ROR kind of shift. So, so we'll discuss what an ROR is uh, when we come to this part of the figure, the lower part of the figure. And then we can shift a register either by a certain shift amount, which can be between you know, anywhere between 0 and 31, or we can shift it by the amount written in a register, written in another register. So basically, we can put in a register over here or we can consider this immediate which encodes the shift amount how much we should shift it by so let us consider a simple 5-bit example and let's say we want to logically shift it left by one position so in this case 0 will come here so we'll have 0 1 1 0 which is essentially you know this part has come over here 0 1 1 0 and we shift in a 0 in the LSP position. So this is a logical shift left. So uh, in ARM, uh, we uh, will see in the next few slides that it is possible to uh, actually fold in the shift information as a part of the operand specification. So we don't need a separate shift instruction. But let's first appreciate the types of shifts in ARM first. Uh, subsequently, we have an LSR. So in LSR, if you have 1011, so 1011 will again get replicated over here in 1011 and in the MSP position we will shift in a 0. Similarly for the arithmetic shift right the bits 1011 will get shifted to the right and in the MSP position we will shift in a 1. Uh, the reason being that we are replicating the sign bit. The sign bit here is 1. So we are just replicating it is arithmetic shift right. Now let's insert it, introduce the rotate right instruction. So ROR is rotate right. So what we do in this case if we want to rotate it right by one position so uh, so rotate right is basically a right shift with the values that are falling off the least significant position they come and sit in the most significant position so let's see let's consider 1011 if you rotate it right the first thing that we do is we shift it to the right by one position so 1011 over here gets reflected over here subsequently what do we write in the MSP we write in the MSB 
whatever was shifted out of the least significant position so in this case zero was shifted out it sort of fell to the right so essentially zero comes and it is put in the msp so essentially we are taking a set of bits and we are just rotating them so another important point is that uh, in the shifting operations in lsl lsr and asr we are actually introducing new bits which were not originally there in the set of bits right at either the left position or the right position uh in comparison in the case of a rotate uh instruction uh we are not doing that so whatever bits fall out of the least significant position are added to the most significant position so now the given that these four shift operations are clear let's actually take a look at uh an example of this so let us uh, without an example it won't have been clear so let's consider the following example so write uh arm assembly code to compute r1 equals r2 by 4 so essentially dividing a number by 4 as was discussed in chapter 2 as same as right shifting it by two positions uh but this is not a logical right shift it's an arithmetic right shift we'll call it an asr and we shift it by two positions so in the case of the arm isa we actually don't have uh Uh, we actually don't have shift instructions so so basically in the previous slide what we have seen lsl lsr asr and ror they are essentially shift directives but they are not uh, so the important distinction that needs to be made is that these are not you know separate instructions in their own right so what we essentially do is that we use the move instruction and we are treating this entire new expression that we have not seen before as actually one operand it is true that there is a comma in the middle but this is actually being treated as one operand and this is being moved over here so what is this doing what this is doing is that this expression is taking the value of r2 and right shifting it so maybe i can write the right shift right shifting it by two positions so uh, i am using the standard uh, right shift operator so we are right shifting it by two positions which is tantamount to equivalent to dividing the number by 4 and then uh, this entire the result of this is being transferred to r1 so as i said let me just you know reemphasize that arm you know most variants of arm assembly at least most of the simple variants don't have dedicated shift instructions rather the shift is folded into the definition of the source operand itself so in the source operand we can specify the source operand as a register and you know th this is not possible to do with an immediate but as a register we can specify the source operand and optionally specify a shift amount and the type of shift so uh, there will be a comma between uh, the source register and the type of shift and the shift amount but the entire ensemble is treated as a single operand and what the hardware would do is it would first evaluate the value of this expression which basically means shift r2 by two positions to the right and then transfer it to r1 so let's now take a look at a slightly more complicated example so let's compute r1 equals r2 plus r3 times 4 so multiplying a number by 4 is the same as shifting it to the left by uh, oops sorry uh, by two positions so what we will do is we'll write add r1 so since the first operand is the destination uh, so we will have r1 is being set to so here the entire operand is actually just one source operand right so we can treat this as a single
source operand. So we'll add R1 as R2 plus R3 left shifted by two positions or multiplied by four. It's the same thing. Uh, so we'll have R1 is R2 plus four times R3, which has been folded into one single assembly statement. And this will make the execution of the assembly statement extremely efficient. So the important point to note is that ARM does not have separate shift instructions. Rather, a shift is folded in to the definition of the operand itself, to the specification of the operand itself. Now let's take a look at compare instructions. So they work very, you know, in a very similar fashion as simple risk. So compare instruction, it does the job of comparing and then it sets <coughs> the flags. So let's first take a look at a simple compare instruction with a CMP instruction. We had a CMP in simple risk as well. And the format was the same. The first operand was a register. The second operand was either a register or an immediate. So we are comparing R1 and R2. And after this, so, so what does comparing R1 and R2 mean? It essentially means that we subtract R2 from R1. So we compute R1 minus R2. And we set the flags after computing R1 minus R2. So in simple risk, we had a flags register. Uh, in ARM, it is called the CPR, CPSR register. It's the same as what was flags in simple risk. Uh, so this is a CPSR register. The CPSR register is called the current program status register, which does not have one flag, it has four flags. So the first flag is negative. So negative indicates that when I did R1 minus R2, R1 was less than R2. So in this case, the negative flag will be equal to one. Then we have the zero flag which means if R1 was equal to equal to, you know, same as R2, then the zero flag will be equal to one and the negative flag will be equal to zero. In the, the carry flag is basically done to indicate that I did an addition and after that a carry was generated. And similarly, the overflow flag is uh, set to indicate that the result exceeded the range of the number system as a result, it cannot be saved. And so the programmer should be told that, look, uh, the addition or multiplication that you are trying to do exceeded the range of the number system. And as a result, there has been an overflow. So here is an important point that we should need to note. It is slightly non-intuitive. So that's the reason I'm putting a big arrow to its left. If we need to borrow a bit in a subtraction, so carry is mainly uh, used in the context of addition, but we need to borrow a bit uh, as is in the case of subtraction. Then we set the carry flag to zero, right? So the moment we need to borrow, we set the carry flag to zero. And if we do not need to borrow a bit, we set it to one. So, so this is slightly tricky and non-intuitive. So let me repeat it once again, what I just said. What I said is that if we need to borrow a bit in a subtraction, so we subtract two numbers and it's necessary to borrow, we will set the carry flag to zero. For example, if we are subtracting uh, zero minus five. So this, you know, if I write in binary, it is as in zero minus, right? So in this case, uh, when I'm actually subtracting, there is a need to actually borrow bits. So in this case, the carry flag will be set to zero. Otherwise, it will be set to one. So similar to the compare instruction, we have a CMN, which is actually called compare negative. Format is the same, but instead of actually setting the flags after computing R1 minus R2, we compute R1 plus R2. Or this is the same as, you can think of this CMN R1, R2 is essentially equivalent to compare R1 with minus one times R2, right? So, so, the, so that's the reason it's called compare negative, where instead of comparing R1 with R2, we are comparing R1 with 
minus 1 times R2. Similarly, we have the test TST instruction. So we uh, set the flags after computing R1 and R2. So if R1 and R2, uh, if the final result is 0, we'll set the 0 flag or we'll essentially take a look at the final result and based on that we'll set the flags. Uh, so let's say the final result MSP is 1, we'll set the negative flag and so on. So TQ basically tests if, uh, so, so what we do is we compute an XOR of R1 and R2. So we uh, set the flags after computing R1, XOR, R2. And we take a look at the result. If the result is all zeros, we'll set the zero flag. Otherwise, uh, you know, if, if the result has a, has a positive sign bit, we'll set the negative flag. So, uh, so TST, TQ, and CMN are typically not uh, very commonly used, even though you can use them if the situation so demands. And if you feel that we can reduce the number of instructions by using these flags. So, so the ultimate reference for any kind of ARM instruction is the ARM instruction reference manual, which you can get on ARM's website. So, uh, so there you will find a lot of these concepts explained in great detail. So the reason that I'm not going into more depth is basically because some of them have many, many cases and sub cases. So this is better dealt with in a manual which describes all the cases in great detail. So we, for most of our work, will only stick to the compare flag. Uh, I'm sorry, the compare instruction. And the compare instruction will tell us using the negative and zero flags, which is very similar to what we had in simple risk. Uh, to basically the zero flag was the equality flag. And uh, if uh, R1 was greater than R2, we're setting the GT flag. So in this case, uh, the flags are different, but the connotation is similar. So we'll use mainly the compare instruction to do our job. So, so now uh, ARM has some more interesting instructions. So the compare instructions are not the only instructions that set the flags, right? So in simple risk, CMP was the only instruction that was setting the flags, but in ARM that is not the case. So you can add an S suffix to regular ALU instructions such that they will set the flag. So an instruction with the S suffix will set the flags in a CPSR register. For example, if I let's say add two numbers, so I can uh, replace the add instruction with an add S instruction. So the add S or the sub S instructions will actually set the flags. So they will perform the addition or the subtraction and subsequently based on the result, they will set the flags, whether the number is negative or zero or if the addition led to an overflow. So all of these conditions can be set. Now let's take a look at a set of very, very interesting instructions that actually use the flags. So uh, the first instruction that we'll look at is ADC. Uh, the ADC is an add with carry uh, instruction. So in this case, we do add with carry is R1 equals R2 plus R3 plus the carry flag, right? So if there is some previous carry, so this uh, ADC instruction, uh, we shall, you'll find an example in the book that uses it. But essentially the idea is that if previously a carry was generated, then we can sort of use the carry. So basically we will add uh, R2 and R3 similar to the add instruction and also add the carry. Similarly, we have a SBC instruction subtract with carry, which uh, first subtracts R2 minus R3 and then it subtracts it with the not of the carry flag. So this is slightly tricky. So what did we say? Let's go back to this sl the slide that talked about the borrow bit. So if you need to borrow a bit in a subtraction, we set carry to zero. Otherwise we set it to one. So in this case, in the previous subtraction, if it led to a borrow, the carry flag is zero. So not of the carry flag is actually one. 
So we what we do is that this is sort of giving uh, effect to a borrow or implementing a borrow. We do the regular subtraction and then we subtract a not of the carry flag and the not of the carry bit can be considered the borrow bit because their connotations are exactly reverse. So uh, you will find an example in the book where we use the ADC and the SBC instructions to actually subtract large uh, 64 bit or even larger quantities. The RSC instruction is similar to RSB where we do a reverse subtract. But in this case, we do a reverse subtract, which is R3 minus R2, R3 minus R2. Uh, but we also subtract the borrow bit, which is the not of the carry flag from this. So here is one example that will show you the power of uh, what the carry flag and the uh, add S and ADC instructions do. So this typically I used to set as an exam question. Uh, and I asked to use students to do this in simple risk. So this was fairly difficult and it used to take a lot of lines because uh, you know simple risk didn't have the support to do it. So what do we want to do? We want to do 64 bit addition using 32 bit integers. So consider the SMUL and the UML instructions. So they save the result in a pair of registers. So let's assume that this is the case. Let's assume that a 64 bit value which is called also called a long value is stored in registers R2 and R1. So R1 contains the lower 32 bits and R2 contains the upper 32 bits. Similarly, we have another register pair R4 and R3 where R3 contains the lower 32 bits and R4 contains the upper 32 bits and together they make a large 64 bit number. See, we, we want to add these pair of numbers, these long numbers, and also save them in two registers, R5 and R6. So what we do is first, so let's say the numbers are of this form, R2, R1, and R4, R3. You want to add them. So the first thing that can be done is we can add R1 and R3 and save the result in R5, which is exactly being done over here. But note the s suffix with the add instruction. The s suffix is basically telling the add instruction that look you go and set the flags. So here which flag are we interested in? We are interested in only a single flag which is actually the carry flag. Uh, so what is happening is that if the carry bit is set we need to record this fact and this is being recorded in the flags that if there is a one bit carry this needs to be recorded. Subsequently, we add R2 and R4, but we use the ADC instruction because this adds R2 and R4 plus the carry. So that's a very important thing. It also takes the carry into account, which might have been generated. It adds R2, R4 and the car carry and saves the result in R6. Right? So what is written is that the add S instruction adds the values in R1, R3. ADC add with carry adds R2, R4 and the value of the carry flag, which is exactly the same as normal addition. Had add S and ADC not been there, it would have been fairly difficult for us to achieve this task. And so, so consider a program that has a lot of, you know, SMUL or UML instructions. And they produce 64-bit outputs. To manage the 64-bit outputs with uh, uh, you, you know, to manage them and add and subtract them would have been very difficult had we not had this particular mechanism. So given the fact that we have seen this, actually let me go back to the previous slide. Given the fact that we have taken a look at 64-bit addition, I would request the readers to also look at 64-bit subtraction. So in the case of a 64-bit subtraction, the idea is very simple. We do exactly this. So, so we will have exactly the same thing. And instead of an addition, we'll have a subtraction. So first, instead of an add S, 
So let me just give a hint, but I'll not tell you the entire solution. So we can, instead of an add s, we can have a sub s. We can write something. And subsequently, we need to go back to our set of instructions and use the SBC instruction. The SBC instruction will subtract with carry, which will take the borrow into account. And we can do something and achieve also achieve subtraction in 64-bit subtraction in two instructions. 